I guess uh, so. It sounds like the problem between you know the two Wasabi and, and Samurai heads back uh, quite a quite a distance. Obviously, if if one founder and one founder worked on something, and then there was some form of clearly some form of disagreement about actually following it, then then that kind of makes some kind of explanation as to where that comes from. Um, I mean, the animosity didn't start there. Actually, I mean, there was the, we did split at a certain point because you know we wanted to follow Zero Link and they wanted to change things up and there was no animosity at that point it was like okay you do you do it how you want to do it and we'll do it how we want to do it um you know uh, prior to or uh, you know um july i believe to, uh, 2019 there was absolutely zero animosity between the the projects at all you know i would get asked you know should i use uh, wasabi or, or samurai i said well if you're on desktop use wasabi because you know we're not on desktop and if you're on, if you're on your android use uh, Samurai because, you know, Wasabi is not on mobile. It was very simple thing. It was only once we, once Wasabi mixes started hitting mainnet and we were able to look at them and analyze them, we saw serious issues. You know, there was, um, address reuse in the mixes. There was huge amounts of consolidation from, uh, in, in a single mix, meaning that there, you were basically mixing with yourself, you know, six, seven of your inputs were, were yours in a single transaction, all these things that we had taken note of, uh, the, the fact that unmixed change is in the same mix transaction, you know, to a, a lay person, they don't understand what this means, particularly for them. Uh, and we tried to explain what it means by putting out research reports or long tweet threads, uh, visual graphics showing what we were trying to explain. Um, and the anima animosity starts where the, the developers uh, of Wasabi brush off what we're saying as if we're, we're making something up to harm their reputation uh, when that's not what we're doing at all. You know, Again, we have a blockchain. We look at the transactions on the blockchain. Anyone can do this. Anyone can check what we're saying. Um, you know, so when they, when we get called, you know, liars, it's, it's just, it's, it's like two slaps in the face. One is, you know, it's, it's, it's personally, you know, kind of rude to call someone a liar, uh, when you haven't even looked at their claim, but two, the data is right there for you and anyone to verify. It's not like we're saying something that can't be shown or can't be proven. It's right there. It's the blockchain. And I think, um, what it, it's shown us really is that. Bitcoin users, uh, by and large, really have no idea how how to even read a blockchain, how to look at a blockchain explorer and figure out what's going on. Um, they don't they don't really have that in their their wheelhouse. Uh, so, I mean, this year we put out a, a seven part um, YouTube series uh, explaining really the fundamentals of how to use a blockchain explorer and how to analyze your transactions. And it's seven, seven videos, each under seven minutes long. It's a really good series. Uh, and at the end of that series, you'll be able to, to track your own transactions and analyze your own transactions and figure out, Hey, what exactly am I revealing when I use the blockchain? Uh, so it, I think the good, the good that's come from the quote unquote animosity is users are, becoming educated, uh, you know, they're becoming more educated. What I would have liked to see is the issues being fixed. So users didn't shoot themselves in the foot when using uh, the software, but we didn't see that. So instead we've seen users becoming more educated. And as you become more educated, you, you verify, you say, hey, maybe is Samurai just being a mean competitor or are the, what they, is there something to what they're saying? And they look for themselves and they can see. And, and once they can see for themselves, it's it's done. During the back and forth uh, with um, Samurai and uh, Wasabi, uh, one of the things that came up is a post from Greg Maxwell on Reddit. And I'm sure that you're aware of that post where he says that he does not trust, trust people from Samurai. And, you know, for lots of people in, in Bitcoin, they are not, you know, um, they do not have, you know, do not, do not possess the technical knowledge to actually understand these things in detail, and they would, you know, refer to people like Greg, you know, to actually outsource their, their thinking. So, how would you? I'm sure you, put, you know, you responded to that, but could you please like address that here? Uh, well, I, I believe the Reddit post you're you're speaking of is now something like four years old. Um, you yeah, know, I. Years I, old. I three years old. Yeah. I mean, I don't really honestly care what Greg Maxwell has to say. Um, 
at all. You know, the, the reasoning for him, quote unquote, not trusting Samurai is, is ridiculous. Um, it goes back to 2015 when we first started. Uh, Samurai, uh, as I explained, started uh, as a project for just me and my, my co-founder. We then created a private group uh, of less than 100 people and sent them the, the wallet file to test out and play around with. Um, it, was, it was not you know, open source yet. It was literally a couple weeks old. Um, and we had, like I said, less than 100 people playing around and testing and, and checking the wallet out. Um, Maxwell got a copy of the APK, the file we sent out uh, to our, that, that closed private group and decompiled it and put, made a post on Reddit uh, saying that, you know, it was, it was, it was bad because it was using blockchain.info as an API. Uh, now back in 2015, there was really no other option. If you wanted to use an API, it was pretty much blockchain.info or, or no one else. Uh, and two, we had already told our group, our private group that it was a temporary, um, lookup until we had our own, um, our own nodes set up and they, everyone knew that. So he, um, you know, was trying to say that we were maliciously including this, this, um, API and not telling anyone, uh, and that that is untrustworthy behavior. Well, you know, I don't really, I didn't really have a problem with him getting the file and decompiling it. I'm not, we weren't trying to hide anything. Uh, our, our small private group knew exactly what they were using. And we had been very straightforward and upfront. You can find every Reddit post I've made about this just going back to 2015, uh, that we were relying on third party APIs, but, uh, before we, before we released publicly, it would be uh, using our own nodes or the user's own nodes. And, you know, we've made good on that. Everything that we've said and, uh, you know, claimed, we've made good on. The code is completely open source. There's nothing that you have to trust. Uh, so I think the, the broader issue of reverting to gatekeepers, um, you know, I think that's something that should be addressed in Bitcoin. Um, what, is, what does Greg have to say? What does Luke have to say? You know, these people aren't infallible. Um, the, 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 the right before or right at, right before Greg made that post is when we first warned about Wasabi, right? So within, uh, we first said, uh, warned about Wasabi and the, the weakness of the mixing, uh, what came after that was Greg posting on Reddit that he doesn't trust us and Wasabi, uh, sharing that very widely with their, their users. Um, as a way to respond to the technical issues that we brought up. So it was a social attack uh, in response to technical issues. And, you know, we don't, you know, uh, we haven't made any official response to it because Greg can say whatever he wants. We obviously disagree. Um, the, you know, our code and what our transactions leave behind the blockchain speaks for itself, I think. I know recently Samurai added atomic swaps with Monero. Um, as someone who studied privacy like you have, uh, how do you see Monero's privacy? Do, do you think it, it's good? So we haven't uh, implemented atomic swaps yet. Uh, all, we, all we mentioned was that we were planning on implementing it. Um, so it hasn't been implemented currently, uh, but it is in the, the roadmap. Uh, yes, the, the privacy on Monero seems to be quite strong. Um, the, the biggest issue with Monero is due to the fact that um, uh, it has this strong privacy and, and mass blockchain. Uh, I think it's more, more difficult to audit the supply. So that's what turns a lot of uh, Bitcoiners off. Uh, but if you're looking uh, from a pure privacy perspective, it appears that Monero is living up to the, the claims. It seems to be a very private chain. Um, primarily what we, what we were seeing on Samurai was um, our users were using a centralized service like FixFloat. Um, to swap their, their UTXOs that they couldn't enter into mixes, so they're too small. So we're talking like um, 5,000 sats to 15,000 sats, uh, maybe a little bit more. So they weren't able to put them into a, a Whirlpool mix. And what they were doing was using a fixed float centralized swapper to swap into Monero, 
and store them up until they could swap back into Bitcoin uh, and enter a mix. Um, this is one of the ways users were handling their, their unmixed change. So we say, okay, if, if our users are doing that already, what can we do uh, to help them do this in a way that doesn't bring in a custodial centralized third party, right? Because if you're using fixed float, even though fixed float is pretty good and there hasn't been any issues with them reported, they could theoretically steal your Bitcoin, right? As you're making that swap, they could theoretically uh, be, be um, uh, given a court order to give any information about that swap. So it, it was, it's not a peer to peer thing. Uh, what atomic swaps allow is for a peer to be a peer swap between a Bitcoin user and a Monero user um, without a third party in between. So we decided that if our users were already doing a swap, we might as well figure out a way for them to do a swap without counterparty risk. So that was kind of the idea around the atomic swaps. Uh, so we'll make, uh, we're hoping to get that in there this year, but we'll see how things go. Uh, you guys started the Samurai Wallet uh, quite a while back, and obviously Monero was in its very early infancy, I think, at the time. I think back historically mm -hmm. wise. Um, did like, have you guys ever kind of considered sort of? Because I know obviously with Bitcoin, I, I guess what I'm going to ask is why did you guys sort of stick to and choose to remain working with privacy in Bitcoin when obviously at, at the base layer it's not that baked in and it's quite difficult to to actually get right um when monero was a thing like did you guys ever re review it at the time and kind of give it a, a, some thought as to whether you should not maybe switch to monero but maybe uh have monero as like an option on the wallet as well as bitcoin things like that like why did you guys choose to go for remaining with bitcoin and working on bitcoin over you know um sort of giving some thought to, to monero and and being able to use uh, the wallet for monero yeah, and that's a good question. Um, so early, early on, while we were still planning the wallet out in 2015, um, we knew it was going to be a Bitcoin wallet, you know, not a Monero wallet or any other other altcoin wallet, uh, because we weren't interested in the other coins that existed. We were really only interested in Bitcoin. Uh, we were earning in Bitcoin, and uh, Bitcoin had the most um, mature and uh, market. Um, Everything else was at that time really just a pump and dump ride. Um, but we did have the idea early on of some kind of transaction that would bump you, take you out of the, the Bitcoin blockchain into the Monero blockchain before you came back into the Bitcoin blockchain, right? So it was an idea that you could, you would break the tracks because you would go jump into Monero blockchain before coming uh, out uh, in, in Bitcoin. And we, we had an idea for it. And we looked into it, and that's when we, we learned that Monero wasn't a carbon copy of Bitcoin like all the other altcoins were. Like, it, it, in order to implement Monero in the wallet, it would take a, a huge um, engineering effort versus something like implementing Litecoin, which is basically Bitcoin with a different name, right? So, like, uh, on the implementation level, implementing Monero into the wallet was, was outside of our... Um, technical ability in terms of how much, how much resources we had, like we was only, there was only two of us. Um, so we, we got rid of that idea very early on. Um, as for why we stayed on Bitcoin, uh, well, I think besides, again, the fact that, you know, the Bitcoin is what we use and, and live on still, um, the fact is, Bitcoin has the biggest network effect. It has the uh, largest amount of users. Uh, Monero is not going to overtake Bitcoin in that respect. Um, and because it has the most amount of uh, usage, there's a the bigger the, the the bigger opportunities in Bitcoin to improve privacy. Like, what could we do with a Monero wallet? You know, not much, but with a Bitcoin wallet, we can do a lot, right? Because we we know where the fundamental weaknesses are on the on a transparent ledger and we know how uh, analysis companies make use of the ledger to to conduct their their investigations and whatnot uh, so we know how we can we can um, you know throw a wrench into their ways and get you know people are why are people using Bitcoin well because they are so we should be there um, to to try again try to give them some decent level of transactional privacy while they do use it. So I guess there's like, um, yes, yeah, so I suppose the incentive is, hey, this is the most popular 
one. It's the one that we also like anyway, um, and that we're using um, when it comes to cryptocurrencies. It's it's obviously the, the the oldest as well, the original. But then I guess also, as you say, it comes from there's there's more of a not problem, but there's more of a use case for you guys. There's more of something to, to absolutely. Solve. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, if Monero works uh, on a on a privacy uh, in a privacy way, if Monero actually works, then it will be delisted from from any centralized uh, regulated exchange. It's just a matter of time. It's already started happening, right? Um, and it really, if that happens, it really does become that Monero and Bitcoin are um, linked. You know. It, it, you have a bunch of Monero, you have no way of converting it into fiat when you need to. And a lot of Monero users are, are um, uh, retailers of, of some sort of another, whether where, where on the market they, they sit, whether it's white, black, or gray is questionable. Uh, but they need to get into fiat. And what we've seen is they go into Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, if Monero works on a privacy uh, level, then it will be delisted and that will be an endorsement for its effectiveness. Uh, and we'll see a lot of uh, inflow into Bitcoin uh, from, from Monero. Uh, so, you know, there's huge opportunity in Bitcoin. There still is so much to do on a, on a privacy, uh, in the privacy space, you know, uh, just in the application space. I mean, there's plenty that can be done on the protocol layer uh, level as well uh it remains to be seen if that happens but you know the opportunity is in bitcoin i think uh it's funny when you are you know you did mention um a point about you know having gatekeepers in the bitcoin uh, community and going through some of the summarized uh, recent tweets it seemed kind of seemed like you know if someone who didn't know they think that you know you've fallen out of love with bitcoin or the bitcoin community and sometimes, you know, you know, people do kind of see that, like there's a certain narrative that you'd have to tow in the Bitcoin community. There's a certain, you know, kind of orientation that, you know, if number go up is the narrative of the, the day, then, you know, that, it's, that is what, you know, it's going to be. And so how, how, like, how does that, you know, make you feel? Because like I said, it still kind of feels like you're falling, falling out of love with Bitcoin. You, like you just, it seems like you're working on Bitcoin now because you know Jeff's already you already have a built business built on top of it. Well, I mean the the number go up thing is is relatively recent. It's a you know 2016 2017 Bitcoiners, uh, I think, and, and newer. Uh, when we got into Bitcoin, it was not about number go up. Uh, it was it was about censorship resistance. It was about uh, permissionless uh, access to the financial system. It was about um, you know, making the transactions that, you know, they say you can't make. Um, and that's why we built Samurai. And that's why we're still we're still here is because that's what we're about. So we think that number go up is a distraction and have no problem, you know, saying as much, you know, it, everyone, everyone who has Bitcoin enjoys it when the number goes up, like no one is going to deny that when the number goes up, everyone is happy. Uh, but that's not what it's about, you know? So when, when you think of it purely in that way, Bitcoin is just another investment and you're, you're actually just revealing a fiat mindset because you think in, you think in fiat. So number go up makes, makes you happy because your fiat, you know, pay, uh, net worth goes up. Um, you know, as far as we're concerned, Bitcoin just needs to have a price. I don't care what the price is. It just has to have one. Um, because that's what it takes to, you know, at, at the basic fundamental level to, to have an economy. Uh, so, you know, we believe that with, uh, with privacy, um, Bitcoin can really be unlocked and as of what it was meant to be. Um, but as, as the kind of talking heads and gatekeepers and narrative is all, is all now number go up, we see that, um, what they what people will tolerate to have number go up uh changes dramatically right so custodial services no problem uh kyc no problem because all of this pushes number up uh and we have a big problem with that you know we have a big problem with custodialism we have a big problem with kyc 
we have a big problem with anything that undermines a user's privacy, which both of those things do. Uh, so it's not that we've fallen out of love with Bitcoin. Uh, if we fell out of love with it, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Um, you know, we've been we've been here much you know much longer than a lot of these people, and have seen Bitcoin um, grow and change. And it's expected that as adoption uh, widens, the the fundamental values um, will be erased or disappear or be diminished. Uh, this is to be expected with any any uh, anything that has that has a broad adoption. Uh, so you know it's not a surprise, but we're we're here to to keep our vision alive, and that's what we're doing. We're doing what we got into this to do all those years ago.